In the last class, we introduced a Goodman fatigue factor of safety, which was given by equation 838 shown here. And this fatigue factor of safety is for the case of general loading, where our fluctuating load applied to the member varies from some maximum value to some minimum value. And so as it is easy for us to determine both the mean load, PM, and the load amplitude and convert those things to stresses. That that allows us to assign a fatigue factor of safety so long as we know the fully corrected endurance strength of the bolts, the ultimate tensile strength, the preload, which we convert to a pre-stress, the stress amplitude, and the mean stress. Now remember, this is just for tension loading of a bolted member. And the stress amplitudes and the mean stresses are easily calculated using these two formulas here, and that's for general loading. What happens if the minimum load goes to zero? Well, if the minimum load goes to zero, this minimum would drop out here, and it would drop out there. And so it turns out under those conditions, the stress amplitude is just half the max divided by the threaded area times C. So this is the stress amplitude, and it turns out that the mean stress is that same term added to the initial preload. So in that case, the mean stress is the same as the stress amplitude plus the initial pre-stress that you apply to the bolt. Under these conditions, the fatigue factor of safety simplifies and is given by this equation right here. So this is just called the repeated loading case. Now we can ask the question, what happens if we have no preload applied to the bolt? So we come up here and we look at this equation, we set that Fi equal to zero. And so that fatigue factor of safety for the case of Fi equals zero, I'm gonna call that Nf zero. That reduces to this simple equation shown here. We just let Fi go to zero. Now what we want is to apply a preload so that our fatigue factor of safety with a preload is larger than the fatigue factor of safety without a preload. If we do that, we just take the ratio of this equation up here to this equation down here. That's Nf to Nf zero. We set that to be greater than one, and when we do that, we get this equation right here. That then allows us to solve for this Fi, which is our preload, to guarantee that the ratio of the factors of safety are greater than one. So this tells me that my preload has to be less than this quantity on the right-hand side in order to enhance the fatigue factor of safety. This sets a maximum Fi to assure enhancement in the fatigue factor of safety. Now, the thing that we have not discussed yet is the other loading state where we have bolted joints that are loaded, instead of in tensile opening mode, they will be loaded in pure shear. Now what we look for when we have bolted joints loaded in shear are these cases that are delineated in this figure here of A through G. In case A, we have two plates that are bolted together and we're trying to pull those plates apart and that generates shear stress at the interface. Now it could also generate bending, but the bending stresses are usually small, so we often ignore the bending part, and that shear stress is trying to move the bolt cross sections past each other, and that becomes a very important failure possibility. The other thing that can happen is if we look flat on the edge, end of the plates and we have bolts that are passing through the holes that are holding the two plates together, we could get ductile rupture of the net section of the plate material between the bolt holes. So that is called net section failure. Case E here shows what is called bearing stress. As you try to pull the bolt through the plate, you get a plastic deformation or a crushing, otherwise known as bearing stress, on the plate itself. But we can also have bearing stress occurring in the bolt. So the bolt can deform or the plate can deform under the influence of that bearing stress. We can have shear tear out where an entire plug of material is pulled out. The other thing that can occur is a fracture, a ductile fracture of the ligament below the bolt, which is called tensile tear out. Those are the states that we look for. We're going to focus on 
bolt shear out, and we can have shear yield of the bolt. So the shear of the bolt is just going to be the load that we are applying divided by the cross-sectional area of the bolts times the number of bolts that are sharing the load, or the load per bolt divided by the nominal diameter of the bolt. Now, we're going to use nominal diameter because you don't want to have the th the threads in the section where you're going to have shear. This nominal area is just pi d squared over 4, and so it's easy to calculate what the shear stress is on the bolts. And you want to avoid the threads because you wouldn't be using AD if you were loading through the threads. Instead, you'd be using AR, which is the root cross-sectional area, and that would be associated with the root diameter. So you make sure the shoulder of the bolt is in the shear plane. You don't want the threads in the shear plane. So what you do is you calculate a shear stress of the bolt, and then you compare that shear stress to the yield strength of the bolt, and we'll get to that in a moment. The other sort of failure that we care about is this ductile failure of the intact ligament, and the way we find that is we first identify the overall width of the plate, and then we have these bolt diameters in here, and so the intact ligament is going to be W minus 2D times the plate thickness and we divide the applied load P by this net section area W minus 2D times T. Well, in this case, it's because I have two bolts. If I had N bolts across the section, I would use N in there instead. The other failure criterion that we care about is bearing in the member or the bolt, and we're going to use the bolt diameter to calculate that bearing stress. And this bearing stress, sometimes I think of it as a crushing stress, but I'm going to go ahead and replace that with the word bearing. All we do is we take the load per bolt, that's P, and we divide it by the the projected cross-sectional area of the bolt, that is D, times the thickness of the plate, the load divided by shear out or tear out. This one is kind of complicated to sort out, so we're just going to avoid that one for now. It doesn't happen all that often. It isn't going to happen unless you put your bolt closer than 1.5 D to the edge of the sample, so we're going to ignore that. Easy to, easy to, to overcome it, and instead we're going to calculate the shear out of this plug right here. And so what happens is we apply a load and we are resisting that load through a bolt of diameter D and that bolt is pushing down on a ligament and we're going to imagine that that ligament right here, I'm going to draw it over here now, it has shear stresses that are acting to resist the applied load P. We take those shear stresses and multiply them by their cross-sectional area. The cross-sectional area A is just going to be the distance over which this must slide. I'm going to call that capital D, and then I am going to subtract the radius of the bolt from that. So I take D minus D over 2. I have two of those areas, one on this side, one on the other side. So I have twice capital D minus D over 2 times the plate thickness. That's my cross-sectional area. I take the load that is applied through that bolt and divide it by that cross-sectional area to give me a shear tear-out stress. So in all cases, what we will be doing when we look at bolted connections is we're going to look at bolt shear across the nominal diameter of the bolt. We're going to look at bearing yield of the bolts and bearing yield of the holes in the plate. We're going to look at bolt shear out through the plate and we're going to look at net section yield of the plate.